Welcome back to Patros Review. In this episode, the D Spectrum 5, 125th episode marker. <laughs> Welcome back to Patros Review. I'm your host, Mila Sipka, and join me as I take you on a ride through the wild world of science fiction action horror, all from my personal DVD collection. Now, now that we've reached 125 episodes in total, not including specials like the previous D Spectrum episodes or the occasional rarity of social commentary, like the Patros Guide to Surviving the Coronavirus, or that clip of Lobel I uploaded ages ago, We've come to the 100th episode for this year. Not exactly a coincidence since my first season back in 2019 was exactly 25 episodes. And that means another D Spectrum installment. Now, unlike the previous ones where I had to split the specials into multiple parts because I went into detail for each bad film I reviewed, this time I'll do things a different way and stream this episode. This time out, I've covered a total of 12 films in the D Spectrum range. From a D minus, which is 1 out of 10, means atrociously bad, to a D, 2 out of 10 meaning it's bad, to D plus, 3 out of 10, meaning it's pretty poor but still has merit enough to care for the fans. Not including that first video game review I did. That one's not including this. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this special. So here goes. Oh, by the way, this Halloween I'm going to be doing a little special or something. Now, after I capped off the 100th episode mark with the D Spectrum 4, which is a free pyre, the first film I covered was for the regular show was the Z Grade classic Mesa of Lost Women which was originally meant to be a low-budget crime thriller, but the production ran out of money, and another director bought the rights, bought the rights to the project and added in a framing device and extra footage that turned the film into a science fiction yarn. The story about a mad doctor, played by the original Hollywood child actor Jackie Coogan, whose line of mad scientistry involves experimenting with transplanting human growth hormones into human women, spider growth hormones into human women, turning them to literally drop their gorgeous but amazingly hard to kill and practically immortal bombshells is utterly ridiculous as far as actual science is concerned. But still, the film, with its infamously annoying score, indeed the very worst musical score ever recorded for a film, with the incessant piano key banging flamenco guitar strumming that guaranteed to put the shits in just about any viewer, except for me, because I'm somehow immune to the psychological effects of this music. <laughs> I can even listen to this music for a fair while without tearing my eardrums out has gone on to the stuff of legend, and while its original release back in the 1950s wasn't particularly successful, it has become a favourite of the bad movie cult when they started their existence in the early 1980s. The next bad film was the 1968 ill weirdo flick Terror in the Jungle, a pretty oddball disaster slash adventure fl flick where a plane carrying a bunch of odd characters right out of the disaster movie playbook, a rich murderess, a starlet, a couple of nuns that swing the coffin carrying the corpse of their mother superior, a rock band wearing silly wigs, any young boy who is constantly crying, something I strongly suspect wasn't acting, crashes into the Amazon due to a tech malfunction. Those who weren't blown up when the plane explodes were eaten by crocodiles, except for the young boy clutching his stuffed tiger. The boy drifts down the Amazon in the coffin and is found by, Sorry about that. And is found by a tribe of Javaro Indians who believe that he is the son of their god. He gets the rock star treatment until he inadvertently becomes a pawn in a power game between two rival factions in the tribe. This resolves itself when right before he's about to be killed, the boy's stuffed tiger transforms into a real tiger uh, and kills the, assistant, the assailant. The boy's father, who has been leading a search party for his son, finds him safe and sound and takes him back home. This is straight up a goofy flick with plenty of bad acting and a seriously wonky and even, even plot. And it took something like three directors, including Tom D. Simone, to direct this one, each doing a certain part of the film. That makes the thing look pretty stupid. I did suspect that this might have inspired the Zucker Brothers to create the immortal comedy classic Airplane, known in Australia as Flying High, since their film supplies a much more refined version of the plane sequence here. Just saying that's all. Now the prize for the most offensively awful movie I've seen so far during this show would be Kingdom Come, a 2014 directed video of B-horror made by Greg A. Sager, who seems to be one of those Catholic dogmatic filmmakers who make those rather harmless but seriously mediocre biblical apocalypse films they're quite popular amongst the Bond again crowd. Now, before I explain why I found this particular film so offensive, I should point out that I'm a, that I'm a devout Christian of the Serbian Orthodox faith, and also being a diehard science fiction and horror fan. Those things are not exclusive to each other. Indeed, if you see horror films as a modern extension of the morality plays that were popular in the Dark Ages, examples of the age old battle between good and evil, and don't see any personal problem with science fiction, then you'll be fine. Anyway, what really got me all worked up. But Kingdom Come is that it's essentially a Catholic dogmatic ripoff of the Saw franchise, made a few years too late. And while I don't have any problems with Catholics in general, we're all of the same faith, that's all. 
is some of the Vatican's stupid mindset that affects this film with some really nasty story touches. This film is about a group of strangers who are all connected in some way, finding themselves in a temporal proving ground between heaven and hell, where the agent of the devil tests them to see if they're worthy for his personal collection of souls for eternal torment. You know how this goes if you've seen any of the Saw films, except there's no actual torture here. Given that Sega, who seems to be a really mediocre director given this is the second film, the first being the stupid and pointless demonic position from Devil's Seed, gives some strong indications of Vatican agent. While I was expecting the moment where a woman is about to be condemned to hell simply because she had an abortion in her youth, only to be saved by the spirit of her aborted child, the young girl in white who tags along with her and the hero, given that the Vatican has strict views on the whole to hot button topic of abortion, now, personally, I don't believe that abortions should be done simply for Baha'i's remorse reasons, but are absolutely necessary. For terminating pregnancies that have been caused by unethical acts like rape or incest, are causing mother's life to be in medical danger, or if the fetus has some defect that will cause her life to be in endless torment where they to be born. And I certainly don't believe that women who were born are damned to hell because of that choice. I'm kind of in the middle of this argument, not, not on either side. I, however, was really pissed off when the scene came that had the victim of child molester condemned to hell simply because she refused to forgive her attacker. What the heck? The Vatican, which has done some serious damage to its own integrity, thanks to all the pedophiles working its clergy all around the world, still maintains that you have to forgive those who have wronged you. I do not agree with this. Forgiving those who wronged you is your personal choice and is not obligatory. You do not have to forgive those who hurt you or your loved ones. The Lord did not force people to forgive, only he said that forgiving will make you feel better, and you certainly won't go to hell for refusing to forgive. Seriously, this gives the likes of Peace 2 sloppy seconds a good run for its money offensively awful stakes. Now, after covering yet another bad Steam Seagull director video schlock who had driven to kill in Australia's Ruzan, which had an amusingly weird bit of incompetent casting, the actress playing Seagull's soon-to-be-murdered ex-wife is actually one year younger than the actress playing her soon-to-be-married daughter, which means that either the casting agent either royally fucked up or simply didn't give a shit about what he was doing. At least the action was reasonable for this type of market, although, although the film appeared to, to, appeared to have developed a reputation as being one of the Seagulls' better films in this era. I don't agree with that. <laughs> it's pretty mediocre. I also hit a personal milestone by reviewing the first film in the legendary Blood Fist franchise, uh, probably the longest-running B-grade action franchise in the 1990s. Now, about Blood Fist, it was a cheap ripoff of the early Jean Claude Van Damme classics like Bloodsport and Kickboxer. I'll eventually get around to reviewing those, also, don't worry. By the way, I've already covered the, the Bloodsport sequels if you're interested in looking at my previous episodes. But with the genius move of casting real life martial artists for the fighters in the film, most notably in the protagonist's role, Don the Dragon Wilson, a Japanese American kickboxing legend, kickboxing legend who became a minor B grade director video action star during the 1990s. That being said, the film suffers from a crap budget. Some pretty bad acting. This was Wilson's debut in the acting game, so he can be forgiven somewhat for his awkward performance. And an extremely predictable plot where those who are experts at figuring out film logic will be able to easily correctly guess the villain's identity by the 10 minute mark or so. Still, this film was revolutionary for its time, so if you're a martial arts fan, this will be required viewing if you can overlook the film's crudeness. On a slightly different note, I covered the first three of a total of eight ultra cheap serial killer flicks I've seen and review for the show made by German New Wave legend Billy Lamel. His career went from making an art house classic The Tenderness of the Wolves in the early 1970s, to briefly working for Andy Warhol by making Cocaine Cowboys, to the 1980 cult hit The Boogeyman, the film he will forever be known for, not least because all of his post-millennial flicks had the words from the director of The Boogeyman, including on their DVD covers, to making that kind of insanely cheap schlock that everybody who makes a mistake watching them considers to be the very worst thing they've ever seen. From Diary of Cannibal to Son of Sam to Kill a Nurse, William Lamel, who made a total of 17 of these shitty flicks, and also what most zombie fans consider the disgrace of the genre of Zombie Nation, uses the lava, rinse, repeat method of storytelling to repeat the same kills over and over, with virtually no variation in what I consider to be the absolute worst production values I've ever seen in the genre. Lamel died a few years ago, so I don't think we'll be seeing any more of these shit that's coming our way, unless another filmmaker attempts to copy this style. But I don't think anyone can top that kind of amateurishness. Speaking of zombie films, I covered my first zombie film, not including those made for the Monogram 9, with All Souls Day, Dear Girls Murtos, one of those sci-fi originals that were written by Mark Altman, the uber-fan responsible for writing the script for House of the Dead. 
Now this film features a badly written story about a group of tourists stuck in a small Mexican town where the undead like to come out at night, feast on visitors, and can only be stopped by offering them human sacrifices. Not a particularly good film, but not a complete waste of time, given considering Altman's poor writing skills. Altman, you're a hack. I also covered the 2010 remake of the cult classic I Spill in Your Grave, which was an arguably slick film, but pretty much pointless since it dealt with a sense of revenge morality so low it can practically be in the gutter. The sequel that followed three years later, I Spill in Your Grave 2, was even worse given it was made on the cheap in Bulgaria, where the story just makes no sense. How they smuggle a drugged up rape victim from New York to Bulgaria without customs noticing, and some of the most royally fucked up revenge scenes you've ever seen. Stephen R. Monroe, you're a bastard. The last film on this list is For Hire, also known as Lethal Ninja, an obscure David Heffner flick about a white ninja who offers to help mayor clean up the crime in the city for a million dollars, of course paid in installments <laughs> of uh, $250,000 each, unaware that his old friend turned arch rival was the leader of the crime gang causing the ruckus. While this film was remade in 1991 and released direct-to-video, it did get a recent boost in popularity thanks to YouTube film critics like myself and internet bloggers re rediscovering it. It's not a particularly good film, in fact it's pretty mediocre thanks to being around amateurish in places, but the wonky acting and goofy story, not to mention the bits that make no sense no matter which way you slice them up, makes this film a pretty good choice for guilty pleasure status for the bad movie cult. That's it for this special episode, I hope you Enjoy this, and I'll keep more, making more of these in the future as the show goes on. I don't do requests, but if you want to know if I have a particular film or question, just hit me up in the comments section. I'll answer. That's it. I hope you guys are staying safe. I'm Miller Sipka, and this is the Apatros Review.